Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another round of GPVWC Sim Racing. My name is Matthew Chuggy Chugwin, and joining me for round two of the GPVWC Atlantic Series in co-commentary is Mr. Thomas Jacobs. Say good evening, sir. Hello, everyone. And on cameras for this evening is the wonderful Mr. Cameron Brewster. Say hello if you're feeling unshy, sir. Hello. Excellent. And uh, welcome to you to uh, round two, the Grand, uh, or round two of the Atlantic Series and the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. Uh, here from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, we come here to the home of the IndyCar formula. Uh, racing has been going on here for over 100 years, and uh, the original dirt surface uh, took over 500 laborers, 300 mules, and a, fl a fleet of steam-powered machinery to create the initial dirt banking uh, and the original circuit. The surface, of course, though, has been replaced, as you can no doubt, um, or no doubt we'll see shortly. Um, it used to be a brick surface, giving it the nickname of the Brickyard. But today, only one uh, one yard of that original uh, brick surface remains at the start finish, leaving a lovely 4.1 kilometer tarmac haven for speed freaks alike. Uh, today, we are using the infield circuit, uh, one similar to those uh, or to that scene uh, when Formula One used to partake of action here, um, although with some slight variation and a few tricky sections as well, some slow speed uh, corners tucked in there for good measure. Um, We'll have to see, however, if our current championship leaders being uh, Walk Racing and uh, Rude Heesterbeek and Danny Asbury, then we'll have to see if they can continue their perfect start to the first Atlantic Series here at the GPVWC and if they can walk their way to the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. Tom, it was dominant last time out at the Grand Prix of Alabama at the Barber Motorsports Park. And uh, we, we well and truly did have a display of dominance from Walk Racing. And uh, we uh, are find ourselves with uh, both walk racing drivers of Easterbeek and Asbury, as well as both uh, Team Pro line cars of Tyne and Brugman in our fast six, in our second phase of qualifying, and uh, we look to have a cracker of a fast six super qualifying shootout to come. Indeed, and um, you saying about uh, Pro line of uh, Tien, he uh, qualified second position last time, I believe he was also on the, um, he was on the harder tyre for a uh, last time out and getting second position on those uh, harder tyres was uh, really impressive. I wonder if he can even do better today when he's on the uh, soft tyre. Indeed, we'll have to wait and see. Everyone using the alternate, the soft compound tyre this evening. Everyone is locked in to those tyre choices now for the uh, remainder of qualifying and the race. This tyre now crosses the start finish line to start his first lap of the fast six phase. Let's follow him on board as he now runs down towards turn one. Nicely through turn one, a very slow first gear 90 degree right hander which tucks immediately into another left 90 degree one which opens up quite nicely with fast turn four, a lot tighter than it perhaps looks, got to be careful, got to get a nice clean exit because then you've got this tricky little chicane complex there, plenty of curb there to mount and potentially fly, we did see Vanderbilt earlier in the first pose of all of them get caught out on that. Uh, thankfully Tian getting through there nicely down towards the chicane section here of turn seven turns eight turns nine turns ten these corners keep flying at you as he navigates those nicely really leaving plenty of rubber down from these alternate tires he's run onto the curb he's got a little stuck oh he's no oh, he's off the track oh goodness me he won't be able to keep this time if he goes quicker that's certainly off track but he's kept it just about together down into 12 got himself stopped then into the very deceptive turn 13 but he's decided he's had enough of that he's going to get himself a fresh set of tires unfortunately tying bailing out of that lap however you could see mega committed already in the very early stages of a fast six shootout indeed and you saying about him running off track at turn 11 to 12 i i i've been seeing like the top guys like he's to be actually running over that white line i don't know if it's uh legal to run onto that tarmac on the outside or if you have to keep within the white line we'll have to see if uh, the disciplinary committee actually have a look at that during their fast laps yeah well we'll have to wait and see hopefully it won't cause too much of an upset uh we still have drivers circulating however uh, the uh, first of which is Jonathan Holmes for um, Positive Sim Racing. He's currently sat in P3, exiting Turn 11 now, well within the white lines, that's for certain. A little bit of a uh, move across to the wall there to get the absolute maximum amount of track width in there. As, as he runs through the very tricky Turn 13, more than 90 degrees there, it really doesn't look it from a driver's point of view. He's got out of there nicely, powered his way through Turn 14 and down towards the start finish. So that looks like a nice lap. Does he improve? No, he does not. Not on that time round. However, the gap between first, second and third is a mere 16 thousandths at this point. We have Tyne. Heesterbeek has improved for Walk up to second place. Uh, 
a sensationally close qualifying session here so far. We have two uh, two minutes and 17 seconds remaining in our session, and I think we're just going to see our drivers fly back to the pits, fresh set of tyres, and just enough fuel to get uh, one more lap, I'd suggest, in, maybe two, uh, to try and better their times one more time. The track is nice and rubbered in at this point. Plenty of grip out there for them to take advantage of. Indeed, and uh, Lars Brugman in fourth place, he's within a tenth of these front runners, so it could be a pro-line uh, walk and homes in the uh, positive, uh, fighting for pole position. Indeed, it's very, very close, and that's just what we like to see. We will, of course, cover our starting grid on the formation lap. We'll hopefully get through as many names as we can there. We got a little caught out last time, but uh, he's to speak on his outlap here, has taken it very nicely, not really uh, pushed the tyres too much, just keeping an eye on it. Who else is doing a lap at this moment? Jonathan Holmes in P3 has just started one. He's running down towards turn one. I'll keep an eye on the live timing to see if he is going quickly. He's to beat now. Coming round turn 14, on to the start finish. A little bit of camber change there. Obviously, they're running up to the uh, 43 banking here. Indianapolis, uh, got a obviously fair land in mind with, with your setup. Make sure that you don't take too much uh, too much there to uh, ruin the suspension as Maurice Black sets a personal best. As uh, Cameron Extraordinaire has got us on board with Rudy Heastabeek, so we'll talk you through what he's doing here. So through the very fast turns five and six, just about managed to keep that one together. Very tricky uh, uh, change there through those curves. The car took that nicely. Down on the brakes, down into turn seven, and Yo Tyen has gone even quicker. He set the fastest lap we have seen at all, even through free practice. So Tyen really laying the marker down to Heastabeek. Heastabeek, though, running through turn ten quite nicely. No need to use that curb and, and to get a little bit stuck on there, bottoming out. Uh, he's to be has set the best second sector of anyone. Three tenths up on the time of time that he has just done as he runs through 13. He's kept that one nice. He's gone on the power early. Can he complete it? He rounds turn 14. Not much more to do here. Just focus on those gear shifts and getting to the line. And here we go. Does he improve? Oh, he does, but he is less than a tenth out. Goodness me, a mere 76 thousandths of a second between Tyne and Heastbeek after their fast lap so far. That's incredible. That is just really incredible. He must have been pushing a lot during that lap. I mean, he didn't, it didn't seem to make a mistake during that, but he's still just under a tenth off Tien. Oh, and he's just gone wide. He's just, he's just ruined his, uh, what could, was potentially his last lap. So I think that's a uh, pole basically sort out for uh, Tien since Tien and Heastabeek were the only ones at track at that time. There we are. By the looks of it, Tien has done enough to take pole position for Team Proline in a superb lap. Of course, the single chassis formula here. We've got different engines, uh, of course, but the single chassis formula giving us superb close racing. And goodness me, I've never seen a field as close as this. Those in sensational laps from Tyne and Heastabeek mean the spread across our top six has gone up to uh, half a second, just over five tenths of a second. But up until that point, they were all within a tenth. So amazing driving. Clearly a few drivers uh, leaving... Uh, absolutely everything on the line there for the fast six session so time the victor this evening and he'll be starting from pole position uh shall we run through our finalized grid then as uh time just makes his way back to the pit lane oh did you did you want me to start on the, yes uh, please, yes, so, please. Sorry. Sorry. i, I think to... there was a lack of communication a quick, there. A, a quick sip of drink i require after that superlative lap there uh, okay okay so uh first position we have yarl tian for team pro line second rude he's to beak for walk racing Third, Jonathan Holmes for Positive Sim Racing. Fourth, Lars Brugman for the other Team Pro Line. Fifth, Danny Asbury in the other Walk Racing. Sixth is Maurice Bracan for YTF1. Seventh, Roy Schroten for Drag Racing. Eighth, Sven de Vries for Satellite Racing. Ninth, Pedro Gomez in the second Drag Racing. And tenth, James Johnson in the Durex Motorsport. And following Johnson there will be Nico Barkley for Scuderia Basilica. Scott Beresford uh, in the first of the TSA cars will be in P12. Luke Walsh follows him for Simtep Jota Sport uh, in P13. David Yunt for in the second Scuderia Basilica is not far behind his teammate. He will be in P14. Lewis McVeigh in the second TSA car will be in P15. Nick Rowland for Midnight will be in P16 with Mike Bell for Smile in P17. Uh, Rhys Gardner for Hins Motorsport will be starting in P18. Oya Garcia for positive uh, will be starting at P19 and rounding out our top 20 this evening will be Alexander van der Waal for Smart Power Racing. 21st is Bart DeVos in Satellite Racing. Uh, yes, um, sorry, everyone's just moved. I think someone's left the server, so it's all kind of made our uh, thing a little bit 
weird to do, but um, 22nd, Paul Watkins for the Mighty Fourth. 23rd, Tom Vandervoort for Midnight. 25th, oh god, this is actually really <laughs> confusing now. Um, I think, sh should we continue the... Just uh, go with the names, just go with the yeah. names. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, I, th I think because people are leaving, that it's, it's moving the whole order, so I don't know who's... Uh, and plus, it, since it's in the practice as well, people are going to be setting times, it's going to be moving them all over the place. So, should we continue this uh, from the 20th? downward when the race actually starts why not, so have why, not? To do. why not of course this is a rolling start um, which is uh, obviously a little bit different here for the GPBWC uh, and we'll hopefully be able to run through a quick order as and when then as Tom just mentioned we are now in a warm up session and uh, the track I must say uh, it's lovely and sunny we won't have a weather effect uh, due to the fact that drivers will not be able to change their tyre compounds uh, in the race due to uh, due to a uh, setting in the mod uh, which I'm to sort uh, but what it will guarantee, of course, is a nice level playing field in terms of uh, drivers not having to account for any weather variables. And uh, weather variables, Tom, is one that you really do have to uh, think about uh, with RPAC 2, of course. And, uh, and setup changes can have a huge serious effect, of course, on, uh, on the way the car obviously behaves in a, say, wet situation versus a dry one. Indeed. I mean, for a wet situation, you generally want to take um, more front wing, more rear wing, and maybe even a little bit more ride height to uh, kind of not kind of aquaplane but have the chance of aquaplaning as much yeah. but yeah as you're saying about uh, this new platform having a uh, this sort of weather where it's um instead of it being a percentage of wet, uh, track wetness it's i think you said it was depth didn't you yes depth of the track so early stages um isi are working on this but uh, it will actually be a, an actual depth of water eventually so obviously actual aquaplaning will be a factor and uh, as tom mentioned particular ride height settings then can make all the difference if you're not scooping up water. In particular, these cars are of course so low to the ground as well, uh, you could very easily find yourself uh, in a sailing boat rather than a racing car if you're not too careful. Anyway, uh, thankfully drivers not needing to worry about this. Uh, the track very flat, no undulation well, other than the uh, slight uh, movement onto the banking through turns 14 there. Um, but a very different circuit to the one we saw last round, that being the Barber Motorsport Park. And uh, I'm sure uh, the circuit will have its own challenges. I think tyre wear is going to be one we're going to have to keep an eye on. Uh, but uh, a very different challenge for our drivers this season, would you say? Yes, because uh, it's going to be mainly about top speed. Because, ooh, was uh, John just one in front of DeVos? I was watching DeVos there. Um, yeah, because you got, you got the long straight of, uh, from the exit of turn 14 down to turn 1. And uh, everyone's going to be probably setting up the cars to reach the maximum amount of speed that they can during that, um, during that straight, if you can excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, it, it's, Barbers didn't really have long enough straights to kind of reach top speed. Of course, we had that uh, infamous, I think it was 12, a turn uh, 12 and 13 that caught out about half the field last time. We have nothing like, well, the closest you can probably get is to turn 5 and 6 chicane. But the undulation on this track, it's, it's more flat and it's not going to make the cars bottom out as much. Yes, indeed. And uh, of course, the, the undulation change uh, and cars bottoming out, I think you're right there. Absolutely. It was a, a huge factor. Obviously, we won't have so much of that. I think, as you say, we'll just have to be careful. The curbs are predominantly flat. However, um, as quite a few drivers have found out, unfortunately, to their peril, um, getting stuck on the curbs is a real factor. If you just run a little wide, you can bottom out on those and you're a complete passenger. And the chicane of five and six, which is so critical because you've got a a very long straight there. You've got to make sure you carry absolutely all the speed you can through there, or else you're going to be a sitting duck. Uh, they have a huge, uh, obviously, relatively speaking, uh, elevation change relative to where the track is. So um, it's, it will be interesting to see which cars have got perhaps slightly softer suspension to uh, take some of those curbs a little more easily. Uh, or as you say, will everyone be running very hard suspension, very low wings uh, to really maximize their performance on the straights? Time will tell. Uh, what we can say, however, is the grid is very, very close indeed. And uh, we have 41 laps here this evening. Everyone will have to stop. The fuel will not allow uh, for any no-stop action this evening. I think the question will be also strategy. Who can make those tyres last? The uh, chicane section in uh, Sector 2, turn 7, 8, 9, 10, all one corner after another. High energy, lots of speed. That will really affect these uh, alternate soft compound tyres uh, in a big way. Indeed, and you said about the chicane of five and six again. Uh, people are going to try and straight line that, and of course that means running over the curbs. I've been watching uh, quite a few people during this uh, the practice session and this warm-up session, and as they're riding over the curbs, they're actually kind of sliding the car across. Of course, that slide is actually 
overheating the tyres slightly and causing more wear. So it, it'd probably be better to take it a little bit more slower and kind of more gentle than straight line it, get the most speed and end up destroying the tyres. Absolutely. And one thing again, uh, not to become the r Factor 2 uh, fan club, but driving technique genuinely matters now. If you are very aggressive with the wheel, you will make that tyre last less. So uh, will be a reward to those who can, for example, just take it a bit steady, perhaps think about the race longer term, perhaps not so aggressive uh, with their inputs, and uh, it will reward them very well. Um, so we shall see, obviously. It's a long race. We're looking at at least uh, 40 minutes, of course, being 41 laps. The lap time's around the 1 minute uh, 10 mark for the sake of rounding. Um, so it's a long drive, not an easy one either. Uh, high speed, constant action. You're going to have to have your eyes on the top of stalks of course, these cars having so much downforce as well, they brake so well, you could see some moves being done from uh, a quite considerable different uh, distance behind. Indeed, and uh, you saying about it coming down to like driver style and uh, keeping it clean for the race, consistency is going to be important. Last time out, uh, Rude Heastbeek, consistent as, as anything, he, he thoroughly deserved that win because he, he didn't put a foot wrong in the, the entire race. And let's see if anyone can... Uh, you know, keep, keep it clean, keep consistent, keep within two or three tenths per lap and uh, challenge the walk guys for uh, the Wednesday. Absolutely. And uh, we may as well quickly recap the current championship situation. I did mention it in the introduction, but walk racing absolutely got off to the perfect start uh, for the first Atlantic Series here. Their drivers, he's to be Anne Asbury coming home, P1 and P2. And of course, Atlantic Series, different point structure, different points format uh, to the other series we have here at the GPWC, mirroring that of, of IndyCar. And collectively, they brought uh, Walk Racing 90 points uh, from the first round. First getting 50, second getting 40. Uh, so a huge chunk of points for, for them straight off the bat. Uh, we have Lars Brugman and Scott Beresford in P3 and P4 with Nico Barkley rounding out the top five. But the constructors' picture, because of the high attrition rate of Barbers, is quite a different picture. So Walk Racing are on maximum points so far with nice 90. TSA Racing, however, because of a strong finish from Beresford and Lewis Brigade in the first race, played... I beg your pardon. They're currently sat P2 with 60 points. Just 30 off our leaders being walk racing. And um, we have Drake, Team Proline, and the Mighty Fourth rounding out the top five as well. So, uh, so all very close in the constructors' front, which will be truly fascinating. And also, one thing we'll have to bear in mind as well is we have a few single car teams as well. We'll have to see if there's an independence trophy there, uh, perhaps to consider. We'll have to wait and see. But anyway, very interesting, very close stuff. Uh, this evening and uh, we really are set up quite nicely um, for our final road race of this little stint uh, here at Indy and of course in two weeks time we'll be here again at Indianapolis but we'll be at the Oval and uh, the Oval a very different challenge uh, I'm sure you'll agree than a road course Oh well I, I, I all I did was the Oval in the um, NASCARs last year in the uh, Masters series I didn't do the Indy uh, 500 uh, I believe you commentated on that uh, so you might have more information than I have but being a primarily like single seater driver i can say that you know uh, the indianapolis circuit it's it's not just two turns it's four so that's going to um you know you've got a bit of a break between turns but you can also kind of get a little bit out of position between them especially if you've got people trying to go down the inside and you, you could end up hitting the walls indeed i mean so yes i did commentate and it's actually worth mentioning that our winner from uh, the indy 500 last year was james johnson and uh, he is on the grid this evening for durex motorsport um and uh, uh, and no, an oval race is very, very different to that of, of a, uh, if you will, a normal uh, road course, because strategy is so much more a factor. You know, do you slipstream? Do you work together? Perhaps even with another driver who isn't in your team, or do you, uh, uh, or do you just go flat out and try and use maximum uh, fuel and tire and attack uh, to try and get absolutely everything out of the car and try and do it on your own? It's certainly very difficult uh, to do that, but it has been done in the past. So we'll have to see what strategy calls are made by our drivers in two weeks. But for here and now, I think we're going to see some very close and traditional, let's say, racing here from the GPBWC. And uh, if anything you've heard or seen so far looks appetizing to you, you want to be involved, there's plenty of racing to be had. Head on over to uh, GPBWC.com website, sign up there and on the forum, and you can potentially be on the grid. Uh, for one of our many series, which we'll, we'll talk about later, I'm sure. Also worth mentioning at this point is, of course, we are socially media conscious and minded. Uh, we are on Twitter. Tweet us uh, or tweet at us uh, using the hashtag uh, GPVWC or at GPVWC live. 
And uh, well, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to fire those over and we can talk about those in commentary. But anyway, our warm up is now completing and uh, the grid is now being formed. So uh, we're not very far away now from our start. We have 30 cars by the looks of it taking part this evening. Tom, anyone you'd suggest watching? Um, I'd have to say the walk guys because they've been kind of dominant. They were dominant uh, last time out and they seem to be dominant here again in qualifying. But, uh, you know, you've got um, Jonathan Holmes, you've got uh, a uh, tie-in as well. So, um, you know, it's pretty much anyone's game. We won't find out until about 10, 15 laps in who, who's, who's looking really good. Uh, so the tyre the tire strategy is not as much of a factor. Of course, everyone running the same tyre, but let's see who has got the most out of that tyre. A level playing field in the rubber front. We'll have to see if anyone uh, uh, truly pushes the advantage or if they just push the tyre over the edge of a cliff. We will wait and see. Anyway, just waiting for our migration into our race session, which will be happening any time now. Uh, I would not bet against... Uh, oh, here we go. As our fact man rings out, I would not bet against either of the walk racing drivers either. So uh, it's going to be, I think, a four-way scrap for the, for the whole race. That's what we like to see. Anyway, our drivers now taking their positions on the grid. We'll hopefully get through at least the top 10, maybe the top 15 on the formation lap. They have one rolling formation lap, and then they will be racing. It's a rolling starter course, and uh, we'll be on our way. 41 racing laps of this Indianapolis Motor Speedway circuit. And uh, just waiting for our pole position man. Oh, Tyan is there. Oh, how could you say he's on the right hand side? There's a grid spot to the uh, the left room. But anyway, everyone is on the grid. The lights are now out, and Tyan is our pace car. So starting in P1 will be Yarl Tyan for Team Proline. In P2 will be Rude He's to be Walk Racing and Jonathan Holmes. Perhaps want to watch actually there for Team uh, uh, for Optimus Sim Racing. Um, I beg your pardon. Uh, yeah. My goodness, what am I saying here? Positive Sim Racing. Oh, goodness me, getting everyone confused. Could be starting in P3. Lars Brugman is in the second team pro-line car, starting in P4. Danny Asbury in the second walk car will be starting in P5 with Maurice Blacken for YTF1 in P6. Roy Schott, uh, Schrott for Fanatec Drake uh, will be starting in P7. Sven de Vries will be starting in P8. Pedro Gomez will be in P9. And James Johnson for Durex Motorsport will be in P10. Would you like me to continue on? Yes, as, as much as we can. P11, Nico Barkley in Scuderia Basilia. P12, Scott Beresford in TSA Racing. 13th is Luke Walsh in the Simtech Jota Sport. 14th, David Junt for the other Scuderia Basilia. 15th, Lewis McGlade for TSA Racing. 16th, Nick Rowland for Midnight Motorsport. 17th, Mike Bell for Smile Power Racing. 18th, Reese Gardner for... I, th I think it's the only Hins Motorsport. I think they're one of the only team uh, teams to have one car. Uh, 19th is... Boyer Garcia for positive sim racing, and 20th it's Alexander van der Wouder for small power racing. Well, unfortunately, we're only cover the top 20 as Tyen is about to enter turns 12 and 13. Final two uh, corners where we'll have to slow down, and he is now the pace car. He will control the pace as he rounds 12. I'm sure, you want to get on the power nice and early through 13. He's to be getting himself across to the other side of the road to give him maximum opportunity to uh, put the power down early. Nicely through the apex. Tyen is waiting. Tyen is waiting. Waiting for the opportunity to go. He's waiting for, I believe, the green to be called from our administrator. And he is off. He's waited. He's got himself onto the straight. And we are now racing. 41 racing laps to come. Tyan got off to a lovely start. But he here comes on the back of Heesterbeek. Here comes Brugman in the second team pro-line card. Holmes taking the racing line. Heesterbeek brave on the brakes. Lock up there from Lars Brugman. And Holmes just about sneaking it through the inside there. Tyne, though, off to a great start. A little wiggle. I think that was a bit of smoke there going through turn two. I think that's just what Tyne needed. He needed his teammate to actually hold up Heesterbeek and Holmes. As, oh, no, he's oh, just hit the curb. It's a turn six. And he's Holmes got a bit affected wide. in that. Yes, goodness me. So that's uh, the worst start possible. He's now recovering. Cars having to take avoiding action. Everyone, however, I think has just about kept all their aerodynamic pieces. But uh, the worst possible start there for Holmes. Just keeping an eye on the replay. Yep, too many cars into uh, one chicane, and that's what happens. As we've got a spin, I think that's the Vries and one of the Smile Power cars down facing the wrong way. It turns eight, turn nine. But uh, Yal Tyne has got off to the perfect start. 1.3 second gap. He's running through turns 12 and 13 to complete the first lap here of 41. Rude he speak for Walk Racing has maintained his position in P2. Maurice Blackman for YCF1. What a start for him. Up to P3. And indeed, I saw, I saw uh, Lewis McGlade get a bit of a touch by Nick Rowland on the rear of uh, exit of turn 10. It's just put him off down the entire 11-12 uh, straight. And he's down in 18th position after starting, I believe it's 15th. 
a bit of drama there from Roland and McGlade, but uh, they'll be going, I'm sure, as Sven de Vries, lovely move then there on Danny Asbury, he's got himself up to P5, scrap there between the two American drivers, that's Sven de Vries up to P5, just keeping an eye on other scraps, uh, we've got uh, a bit of a fragmentation going on in these early stages, we have Tyen uh, with a nice little gap to Heesterbeek, we have P3 and P4 being uh, Rackham and Brugman, in very close proximity, these two just running through turn 7 at the moment, then we have a whole gaggle of cars, all the way 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth not far behind either, uh, all in a line as they're running through turn 7, 8, 9 and 10 now. Of course, aerodynamics not such a big factor at the slower speeds, but you don't want to be in that dirty air for too long. Um, so all sorts of cars off their little little scraps, as I think that may be a car round at the exit of turn 10. Let's spot who that is. That's certainly a front wing. Oh, goodness me, we've got several cars. We've got Plon, Van der Wilder. I think this might be a little bit of latency as well going on here. Got Joseph involved. I got to see some front wings have gone off as well. Willis involved as well. So a bit of a drama there down at the back involving four or five cars. Uh, but they've unfortunately got themselves going. Fortunately, they did stop in the first place, but they've got themselves going and uh, they'll go and get themselves serviced as required. Yeah, I just looked it back. It was uh, Delgado going down the inside of Willis and they make contact on the apex and Paul Joseph just had nowhere to go. He tried to go around the outside and uh, just, just made contact. Of course, everyone else trying to funnel through. I think there's a bit more contact, nothing too bad. It. So unfortunately there, uh, just nowhere to go for Joseph, and he's lost his front wing, so we'll get that one replaced. Uh, and unfortunately, that the, the margin for error in these cars are so fine that if you do just fix that braking point or just take a little bit too much curb, you can find yourself having the drama. Unfortunately, others can end up in that drama as well through no real fault of their own. Anyway, uh, everyone keeping their noses relatively clean at this stage. The top four are starting to break away from the leading pack. Sven de Vries doing a good job of defending there from Danny Asbury down into 12. Uh, he's doing a very good job here uh, for his team, which is satellite racing. Unfortunately, they don't have a livery on the car at this moment in time, but uh, Sven doing a great job for them. Asbury now having to go defensive from Pedro Gomez for Dre, getting in that slipstream nice and early. Here he comes around the outside. He's on the racing line. I think Asbury's just going to have to give that one up unless he can do something on the brakes. No, he's sensible. He's playing the team game. You may get him back uh, later on strategy, I would say at this point, that walk car is weak perhaps. Indeed, and uh, oh, I was watching Heesterbeek through uh, the end of last lap, and he was within one and a half seconds of TN, uh, time, and out of turn 13, he just got onto the outside kerb and kind of got stuck on it whilst mounting it, and he, he's lost a second, he's down to two and a half seconds, the gap now between uh, Heesterbeek and Tyen for uh, first position. And he was also making a little bit of a mistake through the 5-6 chicane. He went a little bit wide there. So, uh, in all time, music to his ears. He's extending his gap at the lead. Exactly what you want to do. Then you can start managing your race, keeping those tyres nice and fresh, using as little fuel as possible, and that will all help you in the long run. And either way, uh, he's in what position he wants to be. Just keeping an eye on other scraps. The, uh, the fight for P5 is starting to uh, go a, a little more in the favour of Sondervis. He's pulling away ever so slightly, but now Gomez has got ahead of Asbury. I have to see if he can uh, bridge the gap to the satellite driver of the Vries. Uh, meanwhile, we have a few other cars. We've got James Johnson. He's made his way up from P10 to P8. Good stuff for him. We've got Nico Barkley, Scuderia Basilica. He's up into P9. We've Devon Yunt as well. Both Scuderia Basilica is getting off to a good start. Uh, also setting their personal bests on that last lap. So uh, Scuderia Basilica going well in the early stages. We have Luke Walsh uh, for uh, Jota. Uh, he is just behind as well. So good starts in the midfield. Uh, I'd say our biggest loser, however, is Jonathan Holmes, though. If all away from third place, he's in 14th, he is continuing and he's now on the move. Uh, going through the turn 5 and 6 chicane, he's now hunting down Mike Bell. Don't think he'll get anything done though, down in 7. I'm just looking at uh, the battle uh, between 3rd and 4th, Lars Brugman and Maurice Bac Bracan. And uh, Brugman seems to be on the back of Bracan, but not able to make a move there. He's not close enough, but he has definitely closed the gap in the uh, previous few laps. So uh, there could be something down with the slipstream uh, down the main straight. Yep. But, uh, we'll Just see. looking at the last completed lap, uh, Bracan uh, was three tenths slower than Brugman over that last lap as they crossed the start finish line now. That uh, time, of course, not updated, but you can certainly see visibly that uh, Brugman is certainly hustling the back of that YTF1 car. Very pretty YTF1 car, also has to be said. Uh, as uh, Bracan is doing a great job there for YTF1, moving to the order. Uh, and last time around, uh, interestingly, Bracken was actually two tenths quicker than Brugman. So clearly the dirty air factor is starting to play a part. Tyen continues to extend his lead. That gap up to 2.6. He's gained a tenth to Rude Heesterbeek. He will have to slowly start to make his way through backmarker traffic, however. 
we are on completed race lap number five of 41. Uh, they'll be completing lap six on this uh, iteration of the of the circuit. We've already started to have back markers as a factor as I think we've got a few cars off down towards turn one and turns two. Yes, by the looks of it, Van der Sloot and Del Grado had a drama there. And uh, I think they're continuing to have a scrap down uh, through five and six. So those two haven't put the drama there um, in amongst their own battle, P24 and 25. So no point. Uh, no, I beg your pardon. Points certainly on offer. Uh, so uh, absolutely scrapping for every last point, irrespective of where you are in the order. Uh, we've got one DNF at the moment, and that is uh, Nick Rowland, who uh, DNF'd on lap three, I believe. So uh, unfortunate for him. I, I'm not quite sure what happened. I think it's too far back since we are uh, have on the seventh lap. So, um, you know, that's unfortunate for him. He, he didn't have uh, good luck last time out, and it seems to have uh, bitten him again here today. Unfortunately, I think uh, he was mentioning earlier in practice and form of band on the uh, the discussion thread for the race this evening that there was a slight issue in uh, FPS, perhaps not a factor, but uh, unfortunately to lose it so early. He does still score points, however. Uh, so, uh, have some points to take away from this evening. So, uh, unfortunately, he is our first retirement, but only one. And uh, we are on race lap uh, seven, uh, or complete break, take upon completed right, race lap six on race lap seven of our 41 lap. So, uh, making our way through the uh, through the race now, Ty leads. He's got around his first back marker, I believe, without too much fuss. We'll have to see how Eastbeak does with the traffic. Indeed, I'm looking down at uh, 11th place, David Junt and Roy Schroten. They were battling down at the uh, infield section, and uh, Junt's got the position. I don't know if Schroten's close enough to get the toe down into turn one, but uh, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a clean uh, clean overtake, a bit of bumps uh, here and there, but nothing too bad, and uh, Junt's got that position, uh, and he's just outside the top ten at the moment. Oh, good stuff. Uh, good scrap going on. Uh, I see that Jonathan Holmes has got past uh, Mike Bell in the last few laps, so he's improved. 14 to P13, as I believe we've just had our second retirement. Yes, indeed, Tom Vandervoort has just retired. Looks like that was a spin going out of turn 12. By the looks of it, he's just run into the wall and he's parked it up. So, uh, not to be for Vandervoort on this time round. He is our second retirement of the evening. So, retirement starting to, uh, to grow in the early phases, but we still have a large number of cars running, as I think that was a move just completed on Sven de Vries yes, by Sven uh, Pedro de Vries. Gomez. Sven de Vries uh, went wide at uh, turn 10. He must have uh, just mounted that uh, outside kerb. Yes, he did, and uh, he got stuck on it, and Gomez just went clean down the inside and took position. Good stuff for the drag driver. He's moved up into P5, and now uh, Sven de Vries is defending from James Johnson. To goodness me, the Durex driver making uh, or slipping his way past the uh, walk racing driver, but Asbury coming back at him now. That fight is not done. Ooh, a little bit of a, uh, a move, half move done there by Asbury, but he can't make a way, his way past that Durex car. So Asbury shuffling down the order at this phase. How very interesting. We weren't expecting this from the walk drivers, but perhaps they're playing the longer game. We'll wait and see as the race plays out. But Johnson continuing to move his way through the field. Up to P7, Asbury pulling down the order ever so slightly. Indeed, and Luke Walsh just behind Asbury. He, he's just staying far enough behind, so there is a bit of contact between the guys just ahead that he, he has time to avoid and gather up the positions that could be lost. But he's also got uh, Nico Barkley and Devon Giant catching uh, onto the rear of him, so uh, you know this is probably going to be a good battle as we see uh, Asbury. He's right on the back of Johnson going out of turn, uh, turn 11. He looks look to the outside. Will he dart back to the inside? He does. Oh, no, he's backed out a bit there. Yeah, but, uh, only, only enough room, I'd say, um, just by the nature of how tight that corner is uh, to get one car safely through there. So I think a wise move, just line him up here. Exit of 13 through 14. Let's see, he's uh, certainly quite close to the back of that Durex car. Can he do anything? No, interestingly enough. So uh, certainly would appear that the Walt Racing car is just carrying a little more wing. In fact, here comes Walt. She has a look, a little half look, but uh, one he can't complete. But clearly, you can see Asbury so much better on the brakes there. Uh, clearly carrying a little bit more speed into the apex of turn one, but just not able to use it. And there's a car in its way. It seems that Johnson has the acceleration out of the corners where Asbury has the straight line speed. And uh, that'll be very interesting. Oh, Ooh, Asbury getting a twitch over those curbs of turn five and six. That's what we were talking about earlier, just uh, trying to straight line it and just unsettling the car. Absolutely, and it's a mistake which you may rue as all oh, Walsh, Walsh off the inside. Oh, dear, 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 space. You must always leave it a space. So, unfortunately, Walsh there affected. He's dropped down to P10. Thankfully, not too far. Half spin he was able to collect. Fortunately, there was tarmac there. But Nico Barkley for Scuderia Basilica has seized upon the opportunity and uh, got himself up to P9. Here comes Walsh, however. He will want to get that 
place back. He's on the brakes down into 12. Goodness me, we're saying it could be done, and he's just made us uh, look like fools. But uh, more, more over me, look like fools. So good recovery overtake there from Walsh. Clearly not sitting down on that one. He's back up to P9, and now he'll certainly have uh, motivation to chase Asbury down. Uh, here he is, though, immediately going defensive. He's got a tag team with Scuderia Basilicas on his gearbox. Can he do anything down into uh, to defend? No, he can't. Look at the overspeed there from Barkley. A lockup, however. He'll be on the inside for two. Can Walsh hang around the outside and get the insult for three? No, he can't. So a lovely move passed uh, or completed there by Barkley, placing the car beautifully using the slipstream. These two, unfortunately, won't be able to go side by side through five and six. So Walsh having to concede for now. But here he comes straight back at Barkley. He's not giving up on this one. This is what we like to see. Purest racing down into the very tight nine degree. Oh, my goodness me. Superb move from Walsh round the outside of the 90 degree left hander for turn seven. Superb stuff for the Jota driver. Brilliant work there. Indeed, and you've got Barkley, Junt, Schroten and Holmes now all bunched up because of that move uh, Luke Walsh did. And Walsh has just pulled away. He's, he's, he's trying to get on the back of Asbury now. Absolutely. But, uh, now Nico Barkley going from attacking to defending again with uh, Schroten and Junt. But I think uh, Junt is just uh, trying to somewhat harass Schroten and get him off uh, Barkley's back. So great move there done by Walsh. I did not think we'd be seeing anyone going around the outside of uh, turn seven today, but I think you proved me wrong there, Luke. Brilliant stuff. Anyway, uh, so he's now got his uh, his next car up the road is that of Asbury's. Um, a couple of seconds, three seconds, in fact, up the road. So he's got a little bit of free air to run into. Oh, oh contact to uh, Schroten and Junk to... Uh, oh, oh, it was a me. massive contact. That all started because Junk tried to go around, I think it was the outside of... Um, of Schroten down into Schroten, turn one. Yes. yes, this was all over P60. Uh, uh, I think it was P11, uh, 12, 13. Very clumsy. Not really enough space. Yunt just getting on the on the loud hammer too quickly, and unfortunately, three cars just collecting themselves kind of clumsily, not really generating much downforce, spinning up their tyres. And in fact, Yunt got stuck on the kerb, briefly trying to recover. So that's cost him a whole bucket of positions there. Uh, Holmes moves up to P11, fell up into 12, but certainly contact uh, we don't want to be seeing, and that was all a bit clumsy. I was just about to say it was great respect given between the drivers. I guess uh, people just wanted to be a bit more aggressive and it didn't quite work out for them, which is unfortunate for, uh, uh, I think it was Johnson. Was Johnson in that battle? I can't quite remember. No, but Johnson was uh, it's Holmes who uh, was, oh, uh, I'd Holmes. say, the most unlucky because he just kind of happened upon that. Yes, he got yes, a little he, tangled up. Through no fault of his own, he got involved, which is uh, it's, it's always kind of um, annoying when that, that sort of thing happens, but you just got to carry on. As we hear from cameraman extraordinaire, thank you for the eagle eye, is Danny Asbury pits. So uh, he was falling down the order somewhat. He'll certainly fall down the order here. So he's perhaps taking an early pit stop. He's uh, recognised that there's a lot of traffic around. Perhaps try and get some free air, get some uh, fresh tyres on that car and get some fresh fuel in as well, of course, uh, and see if he can perhaps try and do a bit of an undercut here. We'll have to see what the walk racing driver does. Uh, but he's certainly our first pitter in. Off he goes, and uh, that's probably a full tank of fuel he's just taken on board. I didn't see the car get raised, however, so he might be on the same set of tyres. Indeed, but uh, looking at third and fourth, Lars Brugman, he had a big lock up in his turn 12, and uh, Brackan right on the back of Brugman now down the uh, straight. And I wonder if uh, Brackan can. He uh, doesn't seem to be closing up much, so I don't think there'll be a move down into turn one, but later in the lap, there might be a little uh, move here. Yeah, uh, so actually that's a, that's a swap round. Brackan was leading that earlier, so uh, clearly Brookman being able to get a move done there on the YTF1 driver. But as you say, these two running very closely together. Brackan hustling the back now of that Team Proline car, so clearly he's feeling feisty. These two do have some lap traffic to navigate first, however, as uh, I think that was Reese Gardner uh, for Hins Motorsport. I think he was just having a moment. But yes, indeed, he just had a quick little spin there uh, and lost a couple of positions, so unlucky for him there, but he's recovered. Um, but yes, nice little scrap here developing for the final podium place. They've made their way past the lapped traffic uh, and they've got a whole load of free air to run into. Interesting fact I've just realised here. Uh, Rude he's to be. He's been quiet, but he's been slowly clawing the advantage out of Jarl Tyne in the other Team Proline car. That gap was around the three and a half second mark. It's now just 1.1 as they come onto the start finish line to complete lap uh, 14, start lap 15. Uh, they are now running down towards turn one. Tyen uh, losing a little bit more time there through that third sector. The gap now down to just seven tenths of a second. So clearly the walk car is coming on strong here in the uh, early stages of the race. Now that the initial uh, fuel load is starting to burn off, perhaps the balance coming a little bit more to him. Perhaps tyres just use a little bit more of the tyres. Good to me. Plenty of tyre smoke coming off that Proline car running through the chicane of five and six. 
but we may be starting to get into the strategy phase of the race now. Indeed, and I saw that uh, Tien did exactly the same as Brookman. He locked up going into turn 12, and that uh, caused him to go wide, almost onto Ooh. the grass. He, he's using a lot of his tyres. I, I expect to see him in this lap, maybe uh, la next lap, and uh, he, he might not be, be far behind if uh, if uh, his teammate um, Asbury pitted in not only a few laps ago. Yep, so uh, Rees Good... Uh, oh, beg your pardon. That was uh, Rees Gardner in the pits. He's just getting himself that service. But yes, Tyne, he's uh, stayed out actually, so uh, not feeling the need to get a fresh set of uh, of tyres. Uh, but uh, yeah, certainly really attacking the tyres. You certainly will ruin a set of tyres very quickly if you keep doing that. However, it has worked. He's got the gap up to one second, so he's been able to pull a little bit more of that gap back. Uh, but clearly uh, feeling the need to, uh, well, defend a bit by uh, going on the offensive and trying to find lap time in the most uh, forceful way possible using up your tyres. So uh, we'll have to see what Heastabeek does here, just making his way past the back market. Gets himself nicely out of the way, and uh, we have a bit more traffic ahead of him as well. So uh, the gap fluctuating, I think it's fair to say, but uh, fascinating stuff here as uh, we're getting towards the first pit stop window. Indeed, and it seems that Heastabeek has all the uh, speed in the first sector, but Tien kind of pulls it back in the uh, second and final sector. Uh, as long as he doesn't wear out his, his tyres too much, he has been locking up and uh, abusing the uh, front left quite a bit to see if he locks up down into here. But uh, as you said, you know, we expect to kind of see, oh, he's locked up again, he's gone a little bit wide. But uh, we expect to see him in this lap or uh, or maybe next lap or uh, he's, sometime he's soon. He's gone round, he's just, lighting just up wrong. the rears. Goodness me, he's really, if he is going to get rid of a set of boots, he's doing it in the right way. He's going defensive straight away. He's know he's had a poor exit out of 13. Uh, he does have enough of a gap, 7 tenth gap to the walk car of Easterbeek, uh, but goodness me, flat spotting tyre like that, you will have a vibration on your wheel and that will not be pleasant to drive with, so uh, he's going to have to start really conserving, otherwise he's going to have a very damaged car uh, before too long, so uh, as Easterbeek now using quite a bit of the tyre running through turn four, uh, but uh, we're getting I think to the point where perhaps the tyres are starting to go away a little bit, the cars are relatively heavy with fuel. Um, the, uh, the, the fuel tank is not the biggest that you may expect, but uh, it certainly will be very different. These cars, of course, are very light. Any form of extra weight will uh, affect them massively uh, as a result. But uh, clearly the tyres slowly to get to the end of their life, and we're seeing a few more extreme moves being made by our leading race of drivers. But anyway, they are comfortably leading. Lars Brugman is in P3. He's slowly extending the gap to Brees oh, Bracken. Change for the lead. Uh, the old Tien uh, locked up going into turn 12 again. And Heastbeek's just gone down the inside and taken the position off him. And Tien is, Ooh. he needs to pit soon. But I think he's just trying to make it to half distance. A, a brave play. We're nearly, we're, we're almost upon it. But, uh, but um, yeah, goodness me, he's, he's losing time hand over fist. And clearly, well, Heastbeek will, of course, been added, uh, quite aware that Tien locked up there last lap around. And clearly the same thing happening again. Uh, four time there and that's relinquished the lead so I think the question now will be what does he have has he been conserving or has he been uh, you know just uh, just keeping a, a nice steady pace uh, and uh, just trying to conserve what he has and try and bring that into the next uh, stint of fuel and time I'll have to wait and see what I will say is both these drivers I'd say you're probably right trying to go to half distance half and half a one stop strategy which uh, certainly time in pit lane costs you quite a lot as I see, Scott Beresford now goes into the pits from P13. Roy Schroep joins him. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so pit stops as he's to, oh, he's to be off. He's to be off. He's spun. Oh, goodness me. He's kept that one just about out of the barrier. He's not lost any wing, but that will lose him all sorts of time and has gifted time the lead. Goodness me. Just as we were sort of saying, he's to be over to you, sir. What can you do? A momentary lapse in concentration has cost him. And uh, will he come into the pits? Yes, he does. So he's had enough. He's clearly gone right. These tyres are enough for me. We'll have to see where this drops him out. There's plenty of traffic on the road. I fear he may come out either just ahead or just behind of a scrap for P9, P10. So I we'll have to wait and see. It is a long pit lane, however. He might drop himself nicely into a gap of free air. We'll wait and see. But clearly the tyres feeling worse for wear as he's now being overtaken by the uh, the mid of the top 10. He's dropping down the order. So over to you now, your whole tyre. Focus change. Can you put in a couple of hot laps and... Uh, Bridge the gap. Well, he speaks off and away. That was a quick stop. Nico Barkley now going into the pit lane as well for P10. So he speak will be coming out just behind a scrap of three cars, that being Yunt, Garcia and DeVos, all fighting over P10 uh, and 11. As goodness be. Oh, he speak out the pit lane, coming across a slow car and a little bit of a bump there. So that's not how you want to be starting your stint. But uh, 
He's on his way now and uh, not at half distance. So would that suggest he has to pit again? We'll have to wait and see. But a fascinating prospect now as Tyron has the lead again and he's gone round again. So clearly, although he's having a few dramas with the tyres, he's feeling comfortable and he's going to try and uh, go as far as he can into this race. I think the reason uh, Rude decided to pit was he, he did hit the, the wall. So I think he might have had a bit of damage, but uh, looking at his pit stop, it, it, it didn't seem slow. It didn't seem like they were trying to repair something. So, um, you know, it might have just been, you know, these tyres are a little bit worn and uh, just get into the pits and just get a new set of tyres on, which would actually gain him time instead of start losing him. Lars Brugman into the pits from P3. He's uh, locked himself up into the uh, into his box, but that's fine. He's getting a fresh set of boots. There's a uh, camera extraordinaire, quite rightly pointing out. Never know, that was a big slide that... Uh, piece to be had that could have been flat spots on his tyres but anyway the interesting fact will be here where does he come out relative to Brugman Brugman in the pits just about to exit he's to be just passing in fact so the gap between Brugman and he's to be was around the seven second mark as he's to be pitted we'll have to see what that is when they come over the first sector but uh, they are in the same camera shop so uh, that gap certainly I think will have come down the question will be by how much of Brugman Clearly gaining there in that first pit stop phase due to that slight moment from Heastby. In fact, the gap there is just two seconds, so a five second swing in uh, Brooklyn's favour there. As Tian comes into the pits from the lead, uh, he should uh, be able to come out comfortably ahead of um, anyone else if uh, people keep going. Oh, Brackan in as well, so that's second place in. Uh, Sven de Vries will inherit the lead because he is continuing to go around. So it may actually prove to be quite an interesting split of strategies here uh, because, of course, the longer you go into the race, the fresher tyres and everything else you'll have at the end, which may prove to be a, a considerable factor. So we'll have to see where Tyen is when he comes out of the pit lane. Going very slow. Uh, almost pulling over. That's very odd. Um, stopping almost as he got to line. I wonder if he was cautious about pit lane speed limit. I think he was caught with that at Barber's. He's come out ahead of Heesterbeek, so uh, he's maintained his effective lead on the road. Heesterbeek, though, not far behind. So we'll have to see. Hopefully that wasn't a uh, pit lane speed violation for time, but very odd to see him slow down so uh, so radically there in the pit lane. Sorry from that little squeak earlier. That was because James Johnson is fighting uh, De Vries for the lead of this race at the moment. Of course, they're still yet to pit. Of course, uh, when they do pit, it will hand uh, tie, tie in a... Uh, TN uh, the lead again, but uh, they're having a good scrap and uh, Johnson in that. Oh, Jurex got getting stopped. Oh, bit of a lock up, bit of a break leg, uh, almost hitting De Vries, but nothing too bad as they are uh, both coming both to the pits. Both into the pits. So uh, here we go. Race of the pit stop crews. Who can get themselves in safely, quickly into their box? Well, any more dramas? Uh, yes, thankfully, uh, a late move or a late little moment there into the breaking zone for turn 12. Johnson, very early pit box. Got himself stopped nice and early. He's on, getting a new set of tyres. Uh, we'll wait for time to come through. He does now. Uh, and, uh, oh, Danny Asbury. Danny Asbury retires. Goodness me. I uh, didn't quite catch what that was. A disqualification. Goodness me. I uh, didn't quite see what caused that. But Danny Asbury, for what racing, disqualified here on lap 21 of 41. So that's a huge swing in the uh, Constructors' Championship, uh, potentially for walk racing. So goodness me. Don't know quite what happened there, unfortunately. But Asbury disqualified. I'm just trying to find it now, but uh, you said about the um, a huge hit. That is a huge hit to walk racing because, you know, a win is 50 points. And, of course, you can't afford to DNF at this stage. Um, well, it looks like he just came across the start-finish line and then just into the pits. I I'm not quite sure what happened there. Goodness me, I wonder if there's perhaps a, a, an infraction of some sort, which is uh, he had to serve so many laps and didn't. Uh, very unusual, but uh, unfortunately there for the walk driver, he is out of this one. Or some form of misdemeanor. Anyway, uh, Jonathan Holmes, he had a little drama early on. He had a, a few more dramas as well along the way, but he's now pitting in from the lead. Ty now retakes the lead. Uh, Holmes running a good distance into this race here. Maybe able to pour a few places back on tyre strategy towards the end of the race. Uh, just keeping an eye on our fight, though, between De Vries and Johnson. Walsh for uh, Jota getting involved there uh, and uh, is separating Johnson and uh, De Vries. So uh, Walsh finding himself in the middle of that fight now. Uh, but Johnson and De Vries having a good, strong race. De Vries in the pits again, I think. Oh! Um, he might have a, a, a stop, go, or a drive through. We saw this last time out with uh, Tyen, where he he sped in the pit lane and had to do a um, stop, go. Indeed, so he's that driving might have been all what Asbury the way had through. As well. Yep, so it looks like the satellite driver has been caught out by the radar man. They do not uh, have any form of leeway. If you break the, pit, uh, the speed limit, you are having a drive through. So uh, that is what De Vries had. 
So that is unfortunate for him. That's dropped him well down the order, but has gift placed James Johnson on the road. So uh, Johnson there, gaining a position. And I'm sure he'll be very thankful of that. So he's going to be up once the pit phase is done, at least to around the P5 mark, actually. So we've got Yunt for Scuderia Basilica, who's not stopped. We have the Voss as well, uh, and Walsh, I believe, as well. So, uh, so plenty of drivers still to pit, and Johnson playing himself in a very strong position in the mid phase of the race. Uh, just to run down our top fives, as it stands, it's Tyen from Heasterby. Uh, the two-second gap between those two. Lars Brugman, uh, two seconds further back from Heasterby. He's running P3. We have backhand for uh, YTF1 in fourth, with David Yunt in P5 as the boss pits. Yes, and there's a battle. I think that's a... Uh, no, sorry. I, I was just uh, two cars close together. I assumed it was a battle. No, it was uh, Pedro Gomez just uh, overtaking a backmarker and uh, Jonathan Holmes doing exactly the same. They've got about two and a bit seconds gap. I'm just trying to find something that's uh, rather close at the moment. Yeah, so the the field, we saw this at Barber's, uh, although perhaps to a more extreme degree, of course, at Barber's. Uh, but the field's starting to spread now, as we would expect. Uh, different strategies slowly coming into play. Um, I would be surprised if uh, drivers are able to get away with a one-stop, but you never know. I would expect a two-stop perhaps being more uh, more the order of the day, but uh, would be more than willing to uh, be proved wrong on this one. Uh, but certainly, we have a breakaway group being our top five, uh, and then we have fairly, uh, fairly regular intervals, the rest of the top ten, all with, I'd say, roughly around a two to three second gap between each car. So certainly a phase where you can relax somewhat, just focus on driving your own race, just attacking the course as you'd like to. You don't have to attack a car ahead or defend from someone behind. Uh, but likewise, if you make one mistake, you will be pounced upon. Indeed, and we were talking earlier about consistency, and that's uh, one thing that Rude showed uh, very that he had very good consistency in Barbers. But here, as soon as he took the lead, he, he did make a mistake, and that, that seemed to have cost him the lead. But he is uh, slowly catching a tie in ahead he, he was two tenths faster on the uh, previous lap almost three tenths and he, he's, he's slowly getting on time so i think in a, a few laps we'll see a, another battle for the lead lovely stuff it's that slow psychological battle at that point all of a sudden you see another car getting bigger and bigger and bigger in your mirrors and all of a sudden you realize you're not looking at where you're going and you start making mistakes so uh, a good little prospect in store there for the lead uh, meanwhile everyone else staying as they were uh, no real action to speak of at this point as I think we've got a slow car down at the pit exit I think that's Paul Joseph mighty fourth, oh goodness me, yes Paul PJ, he was going down into turn one uh, and uh, got himself stopped nicely oh, and I think that was Scott Beresford I think perhaps getting by, and he just gets tagged by Sam Jones, how unlucky and unfortunately PJ, he just kind of ran out of road on the grass, he's run into the wall, very slow speed, unfortunately that's broken his front wings that's the second one he'll have to get replaced unfortunately so uh, bad to worse there for PJ, but if he keeps going, he's three laps down at the moment, he will score some points so uh, all, uh, all useful and it's uh, big point scores which can swing these sorts of championships so uh, you never know, every point vital, especially at this early stage of the season. So a little drama there for Joseph. Indeed, and it's nice to see that uh, we have so many people still contending. We have uh, 27 drivers still going, a lot more than we had at Barber's at this stage. So, um, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, tr probably trying to uh, get, bring the car home and uh, get, as you said, valuable points for the team. Absolutely. Just keeping an eye on our leading pair of drivers. As Tom was saying earlier, the gap's slowly coming down. He's to be uh, keeping... Uh, time very of uh, very honest the gap is uh, 1.3 seconds uh, it was 1.5 last time around so the gap coming down slowly by slowly by slowly and uh, as Tom was saying earlier he's been clearly very quick in the first sector uh, the sector with let's face it most of the corners uh, and uh, time doing very well in the faster section sectors two and three section with more corners uh, at higher speed, so uh, Tyne clearly enjoying himself in the final two sectors, but it's all coming towards uh, East Peak at this point, as they're now encountering traffic. Everyone being behaved at this point, allowing Tyne and East Peak through without too much hindrance, as they run through the very quick turn 8, turn 9 and turn 10 section here. Uh, East Peak visibly gaining on that Team Proline car ahead, just riding on the T-cam at the moment. Uh, and uh, you can see the traffic ahead, trying to get out of the way. I think that was Klon just having a moment down into turn 12. And uh, he's, to be, he's got his target, and that's getting bigger every lap. Runs a little wide there through 13, but gets on the power. Runs through 14, just needs to keep good, consistent lap times up. He will be able to reel in that pro line car. The gap now again down by two tenths of a second to 1.1.
I think uh, Tian is just trying to uh, save his tyres, but he knows that his beaks are going to be more worn due to him stopping earlier. So I think uh, Tian is just going to, you know, kind of back off a bit, keep the tyres more fresh, and then at the later stage, then really attack where his can do nothing about it, or well, very little about it. Oh, was he? Ooh. Sorry, he's got a bit out of shape going into the chicane, and that's just made Tian, uh, Tian pull away a little bit more. So Yon hitting P6, he's going to come out around the P10 or 11 mark. Uh, Luke Walsh continuing to soldier on for Jota. He is uh, up to P5 at this point, the Simtex, Jota Sport. So good result for them on the cards. And uh, James Johnson, sure enough, following that drive through for Send de Vries, which is dropped send down to P9, that has given Johnson six. So uh, good, good racing. Good consistent driving, I think it's fair to be said. Uh, to drivers and it's paying dividends. Indeed, uh, I'm just looking at the closest battle. I think it's P7, P8, uh, Pedro Gomez and Jonathan Holmes. Right on the back of uh, Gomez, Holmes is at the moment coming out of turn 10. And uh, we're just going to wait and see if he can make a, uh, either a lunge into this corner. I think he's a bit too far back or uh, wait until the uh, long straight. Yeah, I'll I'm be... also... Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, I'm also looking at um, people's uh, gaps and lap times. They seem to be invalidated slightly as they run over the um, the white line after turn 11 so I think uh, as you said you know people that would be cut counted as uh, going off track and cutting the corner yeah so so uh, uh, obviously that will uh, make things a little trickier for us to judge but uh, the laps are still counted as far as race distance complete just not the lap time but anyway as you say certainly the closest fat, uh, scrap is Gomez and Holmes in 78 has to be said great drive from Holmes here recovering after a, a moment or two moments, which were uh, no way his fault by the looks of it, what we saw at the time. Uh, and uh, really putting the pressure here on Gomez or Drake and uh, going to be asking some big questions, I think, before too long. You can see Holmes could be so much better on the brakes there down to turn seven as they run through eight, nine, and ten. You see Holmes just a little more uh, you know, reserved in his, his uh, you know, use of the wheel, using the tyre a little bit less, and carrying a bit more speed through the corner as well. Uh, and uh, he's visibly gaining on Gomez, so Gomez is going to have a real mission on his hands as they run through 12 and 13. And if uh, Holmes can just put Gomez off ever so slightly through 13, as I think he has done, Gomez now really has to defend as they run through 14. You've got a long start finish straight here to defend. Let's see what Holmes can do. They cross the start finish line to complete lap 30, uh, or a big, big 29, starting lap 13. Here comes Holmes up the inside. Can he get it stopped? Gomez a little later on the brakes. Oh, goodness me, Gomez. You must leave it a space. Second time I said that one can't just turn it in across a driver like that. So thankfully, neither of them spun, but that's certainly not the kind of move that we want to see being done. Unfortunately, I think Gomez, uh, a little unsighted or a little uh, little error there going through turn 13. Uh, you may have uh, wanted to see that one and have a, a move back through turns two, three or four, as we've seen other drivers do so far. Indeed, I'm just looking at the uh, gap to the leaders. He used to be, must have made a mistake because uh, a few laps ago the gap was uh, within a second and now it's 2.4. So I think he speaks consistency is letting him down slightly t uh, today. And then uh, we might have a, a new winner for the uh, series. Yep, we'll have to wait and see. We've still got a little way to go though. Uh, we're coming up towards the 10 lap mark, however. Uh, to go. Uh, 11, in fact, I beg your pardon. Uh, as we had the formation, a hold, uh, just keeping an eye on the scrap as it continues. Lighting up his rear tyres going out to turn 13, so that won't help him trying to bear down with Gomez again. But uh, but yes, uh, consistency. Uh, Rude Heastby was consistency, if it could be so personified uh, at so Barbers. Sorry, Tyne was just held up. Um, there was a bit of an incident up ahead, uh, ahead of him, going into turn 7. And he just got... He had to dive to the grass to try and get round uh, Mike Bell and... Uh, Van der Sloot who had it coming together and he's to be got caught up in it as well. So I think um, a bit of a loss, more of a loss for a tie in there and he's to be smashed to catch up quite a lot. Ah oh, well there you go. So uh, as as the back markers are being passed, they're having their own races as, as well of course. And uh, a little bit of a moment there has caught Tyne and he's to be out a bit by the sounds of it. However the gap has somewhat been neutralised back to what it was a few laps ago. Now just a second between those two. Uh, but, uh, but no. He speak was consistency, and uh, while he has been consistent, there's been someone who's been a bit quicker and a bit more consistent so far this race. Hope not to jinx him. Uh, time driven a very good race so far, but uh, again, that walk car is filling the mirrors of that Team Proline car, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. Another thing, actually, to, to point out at this point is it's almost roles reversed as far as the teams go. Uh, last time out at Barber's Motorsport Park, we had a 1-2 for, uh, uh, for walk, 
course, uh, Asbury coming home in P2. Needs to be won that one. Uh, Team Proline came home in third place. Uh, however, they had one car DNF being tired. So uh, the point situation between those two, the constructors, certainly looks like it may be neutralised at this point. Uh, and we have uh, Team Proline currently set P1 and P3. Indeed, but there is going to be a small points difference because, you know, um, Ruth Heastbeek and Danny Asbury 1-2, whereas uh, Jarl Tien and Lars Brugman 1-3. So there is going to be a variation in points. But uh, as you said, you know, it's, it's a bit weird seeing, uh, you know, last time out uh, one pro line DNFing and then this time out one walk DNFing. It's, it, 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 hopefully we don't see this continue throughout the season because that would, that would really shake things up in the constructors. But so it will keep it close. If, uh, if they take turns. But anyway, I'm, I'm sure with uh, the addition of an oval, a couple of oval rounds, we'll see a very different type of racing. Uh, and we'll see that, of course, in two weeks' time as we race the oval circuit here at Indianapolis. But returning to the race this evening, uh, Tian clearly feeling uh, now he's got some free air, he can uh, go a bit more quickly into it. And uh, he's got the gap up from one second to uh, 1.4 as he's running through the last sector, lighting up his rear tyres through seven. Goodness me. Really leaning on the uh, right and left-hand side of his car as he's running through turns 8, 9 and 10. So clearly very, very trusting in the uh, amount of grip that car is generating for him. And uh, he is pulling a gap again to Heastabeek to see what Heastabeek can respond with. Yeah, I think T.I. Uh, he knows that he's got better tyres than Heastabeek. And he, he's, he's trying to show off, I think. I say, <laughs> my tyres are better than yours. I can do this and get away with it. Whereas Heastabeek's just kind of probably just groaning to go, mm -hmm, just looking at what Tyne's able to do. <laughs> Perhaps uh, the gap up to 1.5 last time around. And uh, of course, Tyne is on fresh tyres. A few laps, not by many, but just a few. As uh, Brack and I see just making his way past his teammate, uh, Eastern P4, with Walsh for uh, Simtech Jota, still running P5. Huh? Let's see, uh, can't see if he's pitted or not. Um, oh, he has, actually. I looked at it. He had one very slow lap uh, around lap 22. So he may have pitted. That actually may be a fifth place there, the just before him. Oh, great stuff. If so, crack a couple moves, seen him do. Uh, throughout the race, uh, James Johnson is five seconds or so behind him. Uh, oh, I can't. Uh, no, five seconds. I was right. Uh, uh, behind him, so uh, he can't take it easy. But Luke Walsh having a great race there for Simtech. Uh, so, there's a battle for the lead. He's mm. right on the back of Tyen now. Yes, I was. Uh, I was just going to call it uh, again. It's not like mistakes again. Consistency. We were talking about it. Um, you know, in the build-up. This is a big factor lock up there again from Tyen down into 12. He's to be. We're seeing that going. Yes, thank you very much. They run through 13. A little bit of a light up of the uh, left rear tyre, left tyre, but he's got away. Good traction. Here comes Heastabee. Can he do anything? By the looks of it, it seems pretty even Stevens, but here comes the slipstream factor. He's been slowly gaining now, but not enough to work out any form of move down into turn one. And so, a little lock up again down into turn one. A little bit of the curb taken. The car a little unstable. Oh, leaving again time arcs through too. So, time clearly pushing the car a lot. They have fresher tyres, but he may be starting to use them a bit more now. Yeah, indeed, and as we were saying earlier about uh, the, the difference in strategy, uh, Tyen probably having the uh, lower downforce is just neutralising the slipstream effect that he's been getting, because he's been getting quite a lot of uh, added speed going down the main straight, but Tyen having the lower wings will be able to just keep within the range, not not, not too much for uh, a deficit in speed to he's been, which means that he, he can keep the position comfortably going into turn one. Absolutely, and uh, of course, run the skinnier wings so or you can get away with doing that force give you a nice easy way to get past drivers much easier to overtake them on the straights going through the twisty stuff but anyway Tyne and he's to be very close together interestingly uh, you know obviously these two coming to close together again but oh goodness me moment there as uh, Tyne was going out of turn 14 so I was about to say uh, it seems that whenever Tyne is asked the question of right I'm here what can you do pace wise he's had some form of response but he's to be has been able to keep with them now along this start finish straight and so much later on the brakes almost right up on the gearbox there of the Team Proline car. So uh, this one is far from over again. A little bit of a light up there on the uh, left rear tyre. Oh, goodness me. I think that was a little lock up, a little slide there. He's to be seeing this and going, thank you very much. I'll apply the pressure then and we'll see what you do. Uh, so Tyre clearly pushing very hard to keep the warp driver behind him. Here he comes in the slipstream. Can he complete a move into seven? He's on the brakes late. Can he get it stopped? No, he can't. He overshoots the corner. They stay as they were as they now run through turns eight, nine and ten. Uh, Tyen holding on to the lead for now, but you can see visibly on the uh, on the camera shots, you'll be seeing Tyen, the rubber, coming off his tyre, staying on the racetrack. And that's where you don't want it to be necessarily. You want to keep all the rubber you can on the car. So uh, clearly pushing very hard, but critically he is keeping behind 
Rude he's to make for walk. Another little moment there out of 13. We've got Smoke uh, down through 14, but by the looks of it, that was just a moment there, I think, for Sam Jones. Uh, but he is still moving, so no slow cars to contend with. But critically, Yarl Tyen has got the gap up to 7 tenths of a second. When the question is asked, he seems to have a response. I think that little mistake he's to be made going into uh, turn 7 has put him off slightly because, uh, as you said, he locked up and he's, he's worn the tyres out a little bit more. He needs to be a bit conservative for the next few laps. He might have overheated them. He needs to cool them down. He needs to back off a little bit. And then in a few laps time, towards the end of the race, he'll then have uh, good enough tyres to be able to attack Tyen. Indeed. Uh, also got to keep an eye. We've got a nice little potential strap developing here between Brack and YTF1. He's running a P4 and Luke Walsh for Simtech Jota. Uh, Walsh having a wonderful drive here today. And... Uh, he is very, very rapidly approaching the back of that YTF1 car. Uh, these two were running onto the back straight in sector two, running down towards turn seven. Uh, clearly, Walsh having a great, great run here this evening, which is really good to see. And he will now be really piling the pressure on the back of this YTF1 car. He's taken four tenths of a second out of the YTF1 car in this last couple of sectors alone. Nicely, both of them out of turn 10. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. As by the looks of it, we've had another retirement, unfortunately, that being Meadow Quant. Uh, Tyen uh, coming down the start-finish track. He's got a bit of traffic ahead, but he got a nice toe going down into Turn 1. But now he's being held up by Gardner and Garcia, who uh, seem to be battling, I think. Uh, no. No, 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 they're not. Uh, they're just uh, holding up Tyen at the moment. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, this will be the best opportunity for he's to be to try and catch up as Tyen has to uh, navigate through the uh, traffic ahead. Absolutely. Let's see how opportunistic, how opportunistic the walk driver is. Unfortunately, Garcia just about covering the line. Oh, goodness me, that's not what you want to be seeing. Unfortunately, Garcia did have to take the corner, but he could have just uh, got out of the way a little more easily left the walk driver. Critically, though, he's to be did clear him and clear him quickly, and uh, he's not that far behind. So the gap half a second between the two. We have two more bark walkers. We have uh, Watkins and uh, who was that uh, in the other car? Del Grado. He's getting well out of the way. It's good stuff there. Uh, we've got Watkins getting out of the way for Tyen. Just about covering the racing line there for Heastabeek. Heastabeek having to go the long way around. And unfortunately, the cars do want to wash out there. So Heastabeek, a bit of a loser there, unfortunately. But not a great deal that um, it's could have done. So Heastabeek not making his way through the traffic as well as Tyen there. A little bit unfortunate. Indeed, and uh, Tyen using going down to the inside into turn one meant that Heastbeek couldn't get a toe off him, so Heastbeek got no Sorry advantage to talk over you here, but we've got to move here for P4. Here we have Luke Walsh. He's sucked onto the back of the YTF1 car, and he's just going to out-drag Bracken. Let's see who wins down on the brakes. Bracken braking a little bit later, but he's missed the corner. Lovely stuff there from Walsh. He just focused on getting his car stopped, and that is the move complete. So he's moved his way up to P4. A bit of a job to catch P3 there. He's uh, 12 seconds up the road, but great drive here from Walsh this evening. We've only got a few more laps to go. So a uh, good move there from the Simtech driver. Great stuff. Indeed, and it's nice to see great racing with uh, very little contact, but uh, as you were saying, Walsh just forced his opponent into making a mistake, and that's given him the position. Whereas Heastabeek is right on the back of Tyne. Oh, again. grass! Tyne. He's on the grass! Tyne on the grass! Goodness me, he's done a great job holding on to that one, but that is severely compromised him. Heastabeek, if you want an opportunity, it's sat right in front of you, sir. So as they run down through 14, Tyne immediately defensive. He couldn't put a cigarette paper between him and the wall, but here comes Heastabeek. Let's see, what can he do? Does he go left? Does he go right? He's going to go right. He's going to have the inside for the corner. He's later on the brakes. Tyen gives the space just about. Little touch between the two, but nothing too drama uh, or uh, too drama for. Heastabeek maintains his position on the outside. Now becomes the inside for turns three and turns four. Here comes Heastabeek. Tyen has to concede. They now run towards five and six the chicane. Heastabeek now has the line. Here comes Tyen. A little bit affected there by the curb. A little bit more of his tyres lit up and left on the road. But here he comes on the back straight. Can he do anything down this seven? He has a little jolt, a little drive. Heastabeek's buying none of that. He gets Gets himself stopped into seven. Was that a race winning move by the walk driver? We'll have to wait and see. But a moment there from time, just a quarter less than that of his Firestone tyre in the grass, and he lost the lead. So it's all it takes. Consistency is the key in the Atlantic series, it would appear. And uh, Rude Heastabeek has uh, forced an error out of his competitor. Indeed, this is where Tyen is going to get the advantage because he's got the lower wings. He's got he's got the toe down the straight. Let's see if he can actually clear he's to be going into turn one. He seems to be within the toe now. Let's uh, just wait and see catching up. He is catching up. He's catching. Oh, he's big catching, time, he's big catching. time. Is he going to go left? going to right? hold the inside. It's going to be a tough order. They break roughly similarly. He's to be on the inside, but Tyen, lovely move. 
to retake the lead of the race. So not quite enough done there by Heath to be to fend off time. They are as you were. We are on the penultimate lap, I believe, um, unless I am misreading this. So heard is saying last lap. So thank you very much, Cameron Extraordinaire. So this was literally it for the first and second place. He's to be right on the gearbox of the Team Proline Carl of Yardtine. Nothing on through turn seven. He's to be attacking through eight and nine. Nothing on through 10. These two are going to be going right to the wire. Time, good exit from 10. Will he get his braking done properly into 12? He's made a few mistakes. He's to beak us quite a way back. He's having a look. Oh, late as you could be. Keeping it all on the tarmac and the curb. But time's done enough. He's run through 13. Runs through 14. I'm sure he will hug that right-hand side wall. He does not want to give any opportunity as he crosses the yard of bricks. He wins the GPV WC Grand Prix of Indianapolis. Team Proline have their first win and Rude he's to be continues his good run so far of form in the Atlantic Series. P1 and P2, he cements his position in the early going of the Drivers' Championship and brings home good points. But Team Proline, P1 and P3, they're not going to give up without a fight. What a great race we've just seen there. Just waiting for the rest of the field to come home. Luke Walsh for Simtech Jota came home in P4 after a great drive. Uh, Maurice Blacken for YTF1 came home P5. James Johnson gained plus four. He finished in P6 with Jonathan Holmes recovering to P7 after a troublesome drive there. Gomez for Dre came in P8. Sven de Vries after that drive through finished in P9 with Bart DeVos rounding out our top 10 once he crosses the start finish line. He has David Yunt just a second behind, but they're exiting through turn 14. I think only a fuel run out could affect them now, but they're crossing the start finish line. 10th and 11th there for DeVos and Yunt respectively. Barkley now crossing the start finish. And our final car to complete will be Lewis McGlade for TSA. He comes home in P13. Goodness me. Four tenths of a second. Separate our drivers over 41 laps of this 4.1 kilometer circuit. It does not get much closer than that. All I've got to say is that final lap. But I, uh, I agree. What looking, a move from Ty in there. He, he used to be needed to get right on the back of Ty and going into the final complex. I mean, I, I was just thinking, you know, um, the start finish straight, it's quite far down the straight. So if he speak was right on the tail of tie and going out to the uh, final turn, he might have been able to get enough of a slipstream and enough of an overlap to actually kind of make it at least side by side for the start finish or and the finish of this race. But uh, unfortunately, he made a few mistakes and uh, that made Ty, uh, gave Ty in the win today. It did indeed. One stop was order of the day. So uh, egg in my face. We're thinking that will be a two stop. But uh, fair play to the drivers. Excellent, excellent clean racing on the whole there from everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll have some interviews uh, with some drivers in the uh, very near future. I'm just going to quickly cast my eyes to the Twitters to see what you guys have been talking about, if anything at all. And uh, what I love to see is close, consistent, clean racing. And goodness me, um, oh, it's brilliant when you have close racing like that. A true joy to watch, commentate, and I'm sure to drive in as well. And it was also a good show of who's got the best consistency. I mean, uh, Tyne seemed to have uh, pretty good consistency and also did he speak, but they both made small mistakes, which managed to cost them quite a bit. I mean, uh, Tyne towards the end, getting a wheel on that grass, giving he speak a run down into turn one. Yep. And of course, near the start of the race, when he speak got onto the curb of uh, turn, turn 10 and uh, spinning the car around, it's cost them in small ways, but it all stacks up at the end. Absolutely. It, consistency is key. That's true of any form of motorsport. Um, and, uh, and as we've seen in these first two rounds of the Atlantic Series, two drivers driving brilliantly, consistently. And I'm pleased to say we're joined by one now, Jarl Tyen. Congratulations, Jarl. That was not an easy race, but certainly from where we were sat, it was a fantastic one to watch. How was it to drive? Uh, it was great, to be honest. Uh, probably one of the most stressful races I've ever done. Rude. Rude was a really good competitor, and I think we've pleased the viewers. Yeah, it was it was fantastic to watch because honestly, we didn't quite know how it was going to end up. Um, we were certainly at points thinking that Rude will be all of a sudden be able to uh, apply pressure. It certainly did seem from where we were sat that he had perhaps a bit more wing than you. Uh, so he was able to perhaps carry a bit more speed in that first sector, but you were just able to blitz him on the straights. Uh, was that uh, was that actually what was going on? Did you have a little less wing, do you think? Uh, no, I think actually uh, both of us had pretty similar wings down the straight. I think we did 3-0 on both of us. 
uh, by ourselves. I don't know how he's so quick in the first and second sector. He had maybe two tenths on me in the first and uh, one tenth in the middle. But for some reason, I was two to three tenths quicker than him in the last sector. So in the beginning of each stint, I was pretty equal to his pace. Uh, but since I never did more than five laps of race practice, uh, I wasn't very good with my tires, which resulted in me falling off pace at the end of the race. Uh, so the first stint, I struggled uh, really badly at the end, but uh, since Rude made a couple of mistakes, I was able to keep a three-second gap, which was uh, good for me. But at the end of the first stint, the tires just fell off, and they were around 30% or something. But luckily, Rude spun, and I was able to uh, pit at my halfway point which was planned. And then in the second stint, I was taking, taking more care of the tires and waiting for Rude to come up to me before I started pushing on the tires. Well, fair enough. And uh, tire management, we, we did sort of discuss it briefly um, as the race was going on. Obviously, R Factor 2, it's quite a bit different to R Factor or, or many other things. Uh, tire management, clearly a factor. Um, it certainly did seem, particularly through uh, turns 7, 8, and 9, the, the, sort of the quick chicane parts, you were carrying a lot of speed, but also you could see the tire clearly working very hard and leaving plenty of rubber down. Uh, is that something which, in terms of you know setting the car up or or you know driving technique, something you have to consider, or is it just something which you you look at and go, well, this is the quickest way to get the car through the race, and therefore giving the opportunity to win? Uh, the way I took the chicanes was it's definitely the quickest way of taking it, but it's not the quickest throughout the race. And it's something I need to work on for the next race. Every every race after that, uh, I think I wasn't quite sure what line I was supposed to take because of the understeer I had. Um, so yeah, I need to look at the setup and see what I can do with it. Well, good stuff. Well, our next race is an oval, quite a bit different to uh, to the road courses we've oh, been driving <laughs> so far. Uh, any any thoughts about the oval as far as uh, uh, obviously the challenge that that presents or? Uh, uh, are you just thinking, oh, it's another race, we'll, we'll deal with it as, as that challenge comes? Uh, certainly an oval has many different aspects to it than a road race. So uh, I do have some experience from oval racing over at iRacing. Uh, I was in the Pro Series for a while, and uh, I've been racing at the top level there for, for a bit. But IndyCars are different to a NASCAR, so I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. Good stuff. Congratulations on the win. Brilliantly done. And uh, funnily enough, the winner of our last oval race has now joined us in the commentary booth, James Johnson. James, congratulations. A great race there up from, I think it was P10. Uh, certainly some dramas and things going on around you, but you kept your nose clean, kept your strategy good, and uh, you've brought home a great result there. Yeah, yeah, it weren't too bad. The first set of tyres were, uh, I couldn't complain too much. They were pretty good, but I don't know what happened with my second set. They just didn't switch on, so I didn't quite make uh, any headway on what I had already gained. But overall, just kept myself clean. Basically, I was basically standing in for Ben Horrell, who's not here. Um, and yeah, just trying to keep on those clean score some points that they haven't got any at the moment until now. That will good stuff. And of course, the point system, that will be uh, 28 points, I think, that you've now banked uh, for Durex. So all good stuff there. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, by the sounds of it, you won't be joining us in two weeks for the, for the Oval, uh, unless Ben uh, needs you to, to drive again. Um, yep, how, I will be. How, how, I, um, be. I mean, so obviously driving an Indy car, you typically think, OK, Oval car, and, uh, and, and that's fine. Obviously, the, the road configuration, as far as the car goes, uh, is quite, uh, you know, plenty of big wings and everything else. Does the car lend itself to being a, a road course car, or do you think it's better at being an Oval car, as it were? Um... It's actually decent. Uh, I've, this is my first experience with it as a road course car. Um, but yeah, I feel it does lend itself well. But I just think it's better at ovals. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, James, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've got a few more drivers. Uh, hopefully you'll be joining us in just a second. Just wait for our cameraman extraordinaire to uh, to move them in. But what I will say, Tom... Uh, Who, to Ah, there we go. Ah, driver has joined. Brilliant. So, uh, so now joining us, coming home in P4 after what has been a great race, is Luke Walsh for Syntec Jota. Luke was keeping an eye on you during that. Um, plenty of great racing. I think the highlight for me in that whole race was you going around the outside of someone through turn seven. I don't think any, anyone would be able to do. So congratulations, Luke. And what's a great result. Talk us through your race. 
Thanks very much. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't actually remember that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, to tell you, I didn't even know that I'd got P4. I came over the line and changed my display and saw it said 4, and I was like, hmm, how did that happen? <laughs> so I'm as surprised as you are, to tell you the truth. Um, I changed the setup earlier in the day, put a bit more downforce on it, and after that, it just seemed a hell of a lot more drivable. So I was just trying to bang in the consistent times, and yeah, ended up with P4. Oh, good stuff, good stuff. And uh, certainly there was plenty of good racing to be had. I was saying to James just a moment ago, unfortunately there were a few dramas around you as well. How easy, difficult was it for you uh, to make your way through all of those and just focus on driving your own race? Um, back markers were really good, to be fair. They were, like, you know, getting out of the way with plenty of time. There was, um, I think there was one that very nearly took me out, um, breaking into the... Um, the sharp right hander off the oval. Um, I, I assumed because I've got the um, labels turned off. I assumed that I was battling for position. Went to break into it, and they absolutely slammed their brakes, and I had to veer out the way. That was quite scary. But um, I had a couple of moments uh, actually racing with people for position early on. I had a few people turn across me to the apex while I was on their inside, which was a bit annoying. But it happens. I've had it a lot before, so I'm <laughs> used to it. Oh, fair enough. Anyway. Thank you very much for joining us. Great result. Uh, we'll be seeing you in two weeks' time for the Oval Rounds. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to Le Mans, so I won't be here for Indy. Oh, that's a pity. Well, still, Le Mans, great race. So go and enjoy that, Lou. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for you joining very much. us. Cheers. Uh, congratulations on the great result. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, right, and our final driver will be joining us uh, for the interviews this evening will be Mr. Mike Bell. And unfortunately, Mike, he didn't seem to factor too much in uh, in the scrap up towards the sharp end of the order. Um, unfortunately, we saw a few bits of drama for you during that. Talk us through it. Yeah, I quickly found myself in a race between me, myself, and I. Uh, <laughs> you know, after after a couple laps, I fell off the back of the you know like the main battle ahead of me, which was for like maybe about twelfth or tenth or whatever it was. And then I self spun like a moron in the final turn. Had a good few scraps with some people going through, like. Uh, I had a good battle for most of the end of the race with Schur and Van der Sloot, but unfortunately there was a, a bit of a knock from me and it spun him round and maybe that impeded the leaders or so, but it was a good race up till then. And then afterwards it was a bit of just trying to get to the end in one piece. And still ended up in a race with me, myself and I. So. <laughs> how, are you, how do you find this uh, DW12 in R Factor 2? Is it uh, different to... Anything you've driven before in terms of sim racing? Or do you think perhaps, you know, R Factor 2 with all the quirks it brings uh, makes it any easier or difficult than perhaps it may be somewhere else? Um, I don't know. Like, I used to drive the DW12 on iRacing quite a lot. And for some reason, I've just been able to pick up this DW12 really easily. You know, I could do maybe two days of practice to this and be as competitive as I would be in Super Cup, for example, with like three, four or five weeks practice. So... I guess that's, I guess I'm finding it relatively uh, all right to drive, but doesn't really feel like anything else in sim racing aside from other DW12s. Fair enough. Well, fair enough. Fair anyway, enough. thank you very much for joining us, Mike. Hopefully, we'll see you more towards the sharp end of the order in our next round. Of course, we won't be going far, Indianapolis again, but the oval course. Uh, and yes, we will uh, hopefully talk to you again then. So, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, hope so. Got the pole there last year, so got something yeah, exactly. to live up to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Right. right. Uh, and with that, I'll now like to bring in our cameraman extraordinaire, capturing, I'm sure, all of the tasty and juicy bits of the action. What did you make of that one? Plenty to keep an eye on, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, lots lots of action, and it was a lot easier this week. Um, much better frame rate, so hopefully everybody at home had much more pretty full pictures. Um, but those last few laps from uh, Tyan and Hastebeek, absolutely phenomenal. Um of that please <laughs> <laughs> i concur what about you tom you're you're an open wheel specialist in the group among us i think it'd be fair to say uh, a joy to watch i think from a driving perspective as much as a spectator one yeah i really enjoyed the race especially the scrap at the end i mean you, you, in the last 10 laps you didn't know who was going to win and that's one thing that i love and um you know hopefully at the uh, the, the oval indy in two weeks time we'll see a lot closer battles because it's going to be a um you know, a uh, rolling start again, and um, it's going to be very close battling. People trying to slipstream each other, try and pull away, but they're just going to be clawed back, clawed back, and uh, hopefully we'll see even closer finish towards the end. Indeed so, and as Tom said, our next round will be two weeks' time. The uh, GPVWC Indy Classic, 100 laps of the Oval, 
50 mile, uh, same place, same time. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll be able to join us then. Uh, in the meantime, however, plenty of racing, both to watch and to be had here at the GPVWC. Tomorrow we have the uh, next round of the World Sports Series, our Carrera Series. That will be coming to you from Silverstone. Two races to be had there. And then on Thursday, we have our GT, our Grand Tour Championship in the form of World GT. Uh, an hour race there, and that will be coming to you from Istanbul. All same time, same place here on Sim Race TV. So be sure to join us there. And if you want to join in as a driver, as I said earlier, head on over to gpvwc.com to the website and the forum and get involved there's all sorts to do so uh with that being said i'd like to thank cameron and tom for joining me this evening and most of all thank you very much for watching we'll see you next time out on the racetrack